I was a scout a long time ago. And I'm afraid the only thing I passed was my cooking test. But it did teach me in the few weeks that I was a scout the decent things in life. The Nazis, they have their German youth movement where they're taught the foulest things in life. And you're quite the opposite. You're taught resourcefulness, courage, devotion to duty. In other words, you're just being taught the things which will stand you in good stead in the service. And so I say to you, good luck and best wishes for the future. To say that my appreciation of Gibson has to be retrospective. Because at the time I, he was a squadron commander, I was a, a, a lowly sergeant, and one of his greatest problems was he could not bring himself down to communicate with lower ranks. Hello, welcome back. Now, I've been uh, reading up on, on Guy Gibson recently. Uh, everyone know anyone who's uh, heard the Dan Buster tune, da, 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 I'm not going to do it. I mean, most people have heard of the Dan Buster tune, especially if you're into aeroplanes and you're British. You will definitely have heard of the Dan Busters, OK? Well, Guy Gibson was the guy who led the famous Dan Buster raid. In fact, they made a film about him um, in the early 50s. They did a reenactment of the famous uh, raid. And I did know that he was dead. He died later in the war. He was killed in action. And uh, I, I assumed, of course, that he died in a Lancaster because he was a really famous Lancaster pilot, wasn't he? He did the business, got the Victoria Cross for the dams and everything. So I thought, well, I'll read up a bit about it because I don't know anything about him other than... He was in the film The Dam Busters, and it wasn't even him, actually. It was uh, another guy called Richard Todd, who was an actor. Uh, he was actually a paratrooper in the war. He did land on D-Day at uh, Normandy and helped to take the um, Pegasus Bridge. He was a captain, I think, in the Paras. So he was he was a military sort of minded guy. He knew the military role. All he had to do to act the part was put an RAF uniform on and be himself. So I don't think he portrayed the real... Um, I think he would have portrayed Guy Gibson not in the way that Guy Gibson was because I think Guy Gibson was probably far inferior, in fact, to Richard Todd. I think Richard Todd was a much um, level-headed, straight sort of guy because reading up on uh, Guy Gibson's Wikipedia page, I never knew him, but I was, I was reading up and it's quite painful because it's very long. But I was going through it and it, it turned out he was quite short and he actually failed to get in the Air Force because he wasn't tall enough. And he applied again the following year and they went, mm, go on then. So they, they just scraped through at the bottom. So he was one of the shortest people in the RAF. Now, that's not, a, that's not really a problem unless you think it's a problem. You know, you've got a chip on your shoulder about being short. <laughs> communicate very easily with the higher ups, higher than himself particularly, <laughs> and with the more senior of the serving officers. But he had great difficulty in coming down to any, any other level at all. He was uh, the, the appreciation at that stage, my appreciation at that stage, was that he was um, arrogant, he was bombastic, he was a little man, it's surprising how often little men get that sort of attitude. But. Um, uh, and uh, he obviously did have a chip on his shoulder because he was a very aggressive person in his personality from what I've read about him. Obviously, I'd never met him. I was born 16 years or something like that after he died. So I'm only going off what I've read and people's accounts and what people have said about him. But it, it turned out that it, generally in um, in the RAF, he, he, he was a bit gobby. He was full of himself, full of his mouth, and he, he didn't, he was definitely a snob, uh, a sneering snob, and he, he came from a, a very sort of poor end public school, you know, one of the cheap ones way right down. So, you know, to, to climb the snob ladder, you know, because you know what snobs are like, they're terrible, they're terrible. I mean, they, they like to sneer down on people, not talk, and anyway, Gibson was just one of these people. Right, he wouldn't talk to anyone who was in the ranks, you know, sergeants and corporals and privates and things. Wouldn't give them time of day. And he didn't like to talk to fellow officers, right? but he would 
our slick is senior officers, right? And it was wartime. And to give the guy credit where it's due, right? He was quite fearless and dead keen, double keen. He's probably one of these people who who really enjoyed the war. You know, he jumped in at every chance to go and blow people up and kill people and get stuck into the bosh. You know, he didn't want to sit at home with a cup of cocoa listening to the listening to the um, uh, shipping forecast. So I know he was one of these get in and get stuck in and uh, he, he was noticed obviously by his superiors who thought, this guy's keen. This is what we want. We want to stir the men. And don't forget, most of the men didn't want to fight the war. They didn't know anyone who was German and uh, they'd rather not get killed unnecessarily and they would rather... Um, go home and drink cocoa and listen to the shipping forecast then charge stark naked at Jerry being it's fixed that sort of thing quote from Blackadder there but no the guy was the guy was totally ruthless he jumped from one plane to another tried one different role another role he was actually a, a night fighter pilot at one time when both fighters go and shooting Germans down at night and uh, he was just totally totally um, keen as mustard and of course that doesn't go unnoticed He's got superiors up there. And we're having a bit of a hard time in the war. There wasn't many uh, wins in those days. And they needed a bit of morale-boosting stuff. So they thought, this young man's got promise. And so he got promoted. And he got stuck into more and more jerrys. And then when he got so many kills, he could get a medal. And then he got another medal. And he uh, that's why they put him in charge of his own squadron. And he's there bossing everyone about and uh, they formed 617 squadron. Now, the Dam Busters is something that the, the RAF has dined out on ever since, and I'll come back to that point. But they formed this special squadron, and they had this mad idea to, to bounce bombs over torpedo nets and take out these dams. Okay, and it never been done before. And guys there, follow me, chaps, I'm in charge. And off he went, and he's, he was quite an experienced pilot, so... Off he went and he was doing his leadership thing and everyone's going, yes, isn't he marvellous, isn't he marvellous? Mm -hmm. So they put him in charge, well, he was in charge, and off he went and he was doing practising, coming on, on Der Der was it Dermot? It was a dam in, in uh, East, East Yorkshire somewhere, Yorkshire Dales, or something like that. I can't remember the name of it, I think it was Dermot, something like that. And it was reported that he flew so low over the water that the propellers actually picked up water and threw water all over the fucking plane. Right, so that's how, that's how, like, Full on, this guy was, which is what you want in wartime. I don't know how well he'd have done in civilian street or in um, post-war RAF, but certainly in the in when in the thick of the fighting, that's the kind of guy who steps into the breach and he's 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 full on, and he's a good leader. And he wasn't particularly liked. Lots of people uh, called him all kinds of names. Uh, you can read up to what the names. I can't remember what the names were, but they weren't very complimentary. <laughs> One had to accept that at that time he was one of, if not the most experienced, bomber pilot in Bomber Command. He'd already done two tours and he'd done tour on night fighters as well. So he had something to be arrogant about. But I think his true leadership qualities became more, more prevalent when he joined the, when he formed 617 Squadron, in that he, he realised he'd got to get more out of the crew out of the cruise than he might have to, from a normal squadron. So he calmed down a little bit. I think his true leadership qualities were, were shown on the actual raid itself, where he made the first attack on the Moan Dam, because that was the only one that was defended. We knew it was defended, so he, apart from dropping his bomb, he assessed the, the defence at the same time. And then, as he called each aircraft in, in turn, he flew alongside them to detract some of that defence, which to me says, you're doing this, I'm doing this, we're doing this together. And that to me is the essence of good leadership, leading from the front. He always did, he had his, four, he had his, his um, troubles, but he, in the actual fact, he was a great leader. But you see in wartime, a wartime leader would argue, I'm not here to make friends. I'm here to get on with the war. So, I mean, that's the kind of guy he was. They went off on this crazy mission to, to drop the bouncing bomb on the dams, and they did actually knock out two of the dams, blew them away. And it was like 
an amazing piece of airmanship, to say the least. They did it at night, low level. Or it might have been a full moon, but they did it at light. They navigated their way all the way to the target. They flew in at 260 knots, at 60 foot, dropped the bomb at the right moment, and they actually blew the dams. And uh, Gibbo went in first. I'm not going to bore you with all the details, but he went in first, and then he, he followed the second plane, and he followed the third plane, and he followed it to draw the fire from the machine guns. And uh, roaring success, back to Blighty for tea and medals. And uh, they thought, right, this is it, we're going to make this guy a hero, we're going to make him a national hero. So he went off to the, the palace with his crew and his fellow squadron people, and uh, he got the Victoria Cross for that. So there he was, the Victoria Cross, promoted his now wing commander, Gibson, 25 years old. It's unheard of to be a wing commander at 25 years old and have the Victoria Cross and the DFC, the DSO and bar and bar and goodness knows what else. So they thought we're going to make him a propaganda piece because he's like full of himself. Now, don't forget, if you'd have had all, <laughs> if, you, if you were 26 years old and you had all that, you know, you'd be full of yourself as well when you'd be a proper like Tom Cruise, Maverick. You Bullshit, you can be my wingman. So... They put him on the radio, they put him on um, the BBC and he's there chatting about, oh yes, how I blew Jerry's away, I sprinkled them with bombs and went back the next day and half of the ships are missing and all this sort of... You can hear him in his... his, his it does sound a bit arrogant actually, but I don't know he was, honestly. I don't, I don't know, I'm not going to do a character assassination on him. What I am actually talking about is how he died. And I think I know how he died. He went off to Canada. They sent him off to Canada. They sent him to, on leave to write a few books about thrashing Jerry. And uh, he did that. So they sent him off to Canada with a load of VIPs. And he, he went around Canada giving after-dinner speeches about how marvellous he was and uh, how, how the war was going. And he went around America. The Americas were whining and dining him every night. And he's like, he had to have a break, a holiday, to get over all the whining and dining. <laughs> And then he came back to the UK, they put him back in a squadron. And of course, by that time, he must have been so full of himself. I'm the big I am, I'm... And he was, he was the big I am. Can't take that away from him. And uh, when he died, he was flying a mosquito. Now, I've been flying mosquitoes in VR. I've always wanted to fly a mosquito. It's one of my favourite aeroplanes of all time. And I downloaded one in VR and I've been flying it. And I had about 10 hours flying mosquitoes and I had a nasty prank. I don't normally have nasty pranks, in, even in VR. Okay, I had had the odd one, but this was a particularly nasty one. And it turned out it was the same prank that Guy Gibson had, okay? And uh, I know exactly what happened because I was fortunate enough to be able to rewind the game and see where it all started to go wrong. Out at a really inconvenient moment. Oh, gosh. And how long it took me to react and think, ah, yes, I know what the problem is. Sort it out. Boom. Not enough time to do it because I was too low. Now that happened to me, and I was like, ah, oh. because it was my fault. Okay. But, you know, I've only got 10 hours. I do like to do a lot of hours on a particular airplane that I like so I get to know it inside and out and get get to play with it and do, go do loads of th different manoeuvres in it so I get to know its good points and its bad points. And it's fair to say that if, if an airplane is actually good, the Americans would have bought it off us, OK? Like the, the Canberra, for example, and the Harrier. <sighs> Couldn't get enough of them. They wanted them. They didn't buy many... In fact, I don't think they bought any. They, they might have had a few um, de Havilland mosquitoes, but they didn't really like them that much and they must have given them back or something. So from the American's point of view, it couldn't have been that good. But from my point of view, I loved it. I think it's great. And uh, I'm there flying along, as I said. I'd done just under about 10 hours flying it in VR. And I was flying it very hard and very fast and very low and... 
as you would, you know, being an aggressive pilot, just like Guy Gibson would have been on in his day. Only I'm not getting shot at, which is major difference between me. The guy was fearless. He didn't mind being shot at. He reveled in it, okay? Whereas I, I, I am not happy about being shot at. Not at all. But there's a reason for flying low. Because Jerry, with his rifle, if he hears you coming and he realises you're an enemy, he cocks his rifle and he gets his rifle up and you zoom past at 400 miles an hour. Boom! He's lucky if he can get one shot off. Right? But if you're flying at 1,000 foot, he's got a much better chance of getting a few shots off at you. And if someone's around with a machine gun, they've got so basically, if you're right down on the deck flying really low and really fast, it's much safer as far as ground fire is concerned. So that's obviously why he did it. Now, fuel management on the, on the Mosquito. I read in his Wikipedia page, he only had nine and a half hours on the Mosquito. So he wasn't familiar with the type at all. He was a real beginner. He had a few goes, he's I'm Guy Gibson, I've got a Victoria Cross, look at that, marvellous. And I've got all this experience, I've got tons of flight, I'm very experienced. And he probably would have got the pilot's operating handbook and gone, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know, can't speak for the guy, but there are three switches and it's just there in the Mosquito. Okay, three switches, one, two, three. One is the tip tanks, which are these disposable tanks on the end of the wings. The second switch down is the wing tanks. Okay, and the third switch down is the main fuel tank, which is in the belly of the aircraft in the fuselage. Okay, so you take off, you've got all three switches on. Okay, you can turn them off. It pressurized fuel, but pressurizes the tanks and the tanks for the pressure forces the fuel to the engines. You take off on all the tanks, you get to altitude, and then what you really want to do, it says in the manual, is turn the main tank off, turn the wing tanks off, and feed off the, the outer tanks, the, the tip tanks, because you want to get rid of them first. You can even press a button and drop them off the plane if you needed to. But you've got no fuel gauge, so you don't know. You've got no idea how much fuel is in the tanks. So you just have to fly along and wait. And then at some point in the flight, your fuel pressure will drop off and your power, your RPM will start to drop off. And you think, ah, both engines are failing. I've run out of fuel. So you then reach over and flick the wing tanks on. Bing! And you can turn the top tanks off. Or press eject. Wing tank's gone. So he will have definitely have done that. Okay, and he's off on his mission. He was dropping markers bing, 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 to light up the target for the bombers to come in and blast away. So that's what he was doing. He was all focused on doing that and shouting and coordinating things and being a big gob that he was notorious for. Which I know not a lot of people liked him for that, but that's not his fault. That's what commanders do. Okay, they're not there to be popular. Let's get the job done. Now, that's all very well, turning the fuel on when you're at altitude, but there's a delay, okay, between the engines. It's like driving a motorbike. I used to have an old motorbike with no fuel gauge, and the first thing you knew, you run out of fuel. You lost power to reach down and turn the reserve tank on, and then by the time the petrol gets to the car, it picks up again. So there's a big delay. Okay, it doesn't matter if you're at three, four, ten thousand feet. Okay, that delay doesn't matter because you, what's going to happen? You're going to sink a few hundred feet. So what? But when you're flying along at ground level or just above the ground, like Guy Gibson did and like I did in my uh, noto my, my memorable crash, he's run out of fuel and he's gone shit. And he's looked across and he's gone bang. And that delay was all it took, okay? Now, maybe that delay took a bit longer than it should have done for the main tank to kick in. Or maybe there was a problem. Now, if there'd been a problem, there are cross feeds. You can pump fuel from one tank to another if there is a problem, but you need time to do that. And most of these cross feeds, I think, were behind the pilot seat. So the guy in the navigator's seat would do the cross feed and pressing buttons and pumping. That's where the radio was and all kinds of stuff. 
And uh, the guy he had next to him was a, was a one of navigation instructors from the RAF base, but he'd never been on an operational mission in a, in a in a mosquito, so he probably didn't know what to do. He probably got put in there the last minute. Gibson probably said, "You get in that mosquito. You're going now." And he's like, bup, 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 bup. "Get in, do his job." And off. Who knows? But he was gassing it along at low level, and I think he ran out of fuel. Witness statements said, who saw the crash, said the cockpit was illuminated, the light was on in the cockpit. You'd never turn the lights on in the cockpit unless something was up, okay? So he's, he's run out of fuel, he's hit the button, nothing's happening. He's turned the lights on, he's thinking, fuck, fuck, fuck. I wish I'd read that manual. Ah, oh, I don't know. Boom. I was running in at 400 miles an hour, just under down the runway when I had my crash when I ran out of fuel I did actually reach across and actually hit the button and uh, in VR but it wasn't enough time I uh, had even raised the nose but it was still sinking out Pause button Hail runs out at a really inconvenient moment Oh, fuck. Fuel management, okay? It's very important. Watch your fuel. I should have changed tanks long before that ran out. Now, don't forget, in X Plane 11, you're skidding along. And as a pilot, you're horrified because you've crashed. And the last thing any pilot wants to do is crash or even have a ding. I'd so I'm like that. And I didn't fly the mosquito for weeks <laughs> after that. Because I kept rewinding it and thinking, oh. but there is, there's a big delay. Big delay. You sink out when this happens. And this is normal operating procedure. So note to self, I said to myself, right, if you're ever flying low again, low and fast, turn all the switches on but the problem with that is you use all the fuel at the main tank first and the wing tanks so it's doing it in the reverse order to what you want it to do for the stability of the aircraft anyway that is my theory in what happened to guy gibson because no one will ever actually know for sure he's spanked in in a wooden airplane at 300 odd miles an hour the thing disintegrated on impact in uh, in holland and the netherlands and uh there wasn't much left but they did examine the wreck site some years later they excavated it and there wasn't any sign of um, enemy damage to the aircraft the, the, obviously the aircraft had crashed but you'd see bullet holes and things in it and there wasn't any signs so I'm afraid to say that I think in my opinion which is just an opinion is that he died from pilot error he wasn't sufficiently familiar with the type of aircraft okay and he was overconfident. That's what I think. And that was exactly what happened to me. And I was at the same level of experience as he was on the Mosquito at the time that I had the crash. The bombing of the dams was a success, but like a load of the planes got wiped out. There wasn't many that made it back to uh, Scampton that night. And uh, I think something like 1,500 civilians drowned in their houses while they were asleep in bed as a result of the flooding of the, the breaching of the dams. And later the Geneva Convention decided that bombing of dams in warfare is actually a war crime as a direct result of the dam busters. They did flood the valley, they did kill loads of people, they did stop um, production, industrial production for a few weeks until they fixed the dams and then, so they didn't really make a major uh, dent in the German war machine, but it was a major propaganda effort on, uh, on the behalf of the, the British for sure.